Hi everyone and welcome back to the USML channel on YouTube. My name is Dr. Axinia and today's video is dedicated on the super high yield mechanism of action of antibiotics, antifungals and more. So keep watching, I hope you enjoy this video. I have tried to give you the most important information, the most high yield information for your steps and for the boards in one video. So let me know what you think and uh, enjoy your studies. Let's get started. The USML Step 1, 2 and 3 exams just love asking about bactericidal versus bacteriostatic antibiotics. So here's the list and then we will explain why they work the way they work. The bactericidal antibiotics are the aminoglycosides, the cephalosporins, the fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, the penicillins, the carbapenems, astronam and vancomycin. Whereas the bacteriostatic antibiotics are the clindamycin, chloramphenicol, the macrolides, linezolid, and tetracyclines. As the name implies, the bactericidal antibiotics are those who kill the bacteria directly, and the bacteriostatic antibiotics will limit the growth of the bacteria by interfering mainly with the bacterial protein production. Here on this slide, we will be reviewing the bacteriostatic antibiotics mechanism of action. First, let's remind ourselves some basics from step one. Proteins are made of long chains of amino acids, as you know, they are joined together. And the instructions for making proteins are found in the bacterial DNA, which is found in the bacterial chromosome. Now, the DNA instructions are transcribed into RNA. DNA and RNA are also called nucleic acids and they are made of nucleotides, which are made of sugar, phosphate groups and nitrogen base. Now the bases in the DNA are adenine and guanine, which are purine bases, and we have cytosine and thymine, which are pyrimidine bases. The only difference in the RNA bases is that it contains uracil instead of thymine. Alright, so once the DNA instructions are transcribed into mRNA, this piece of RNA moves to the cell organelles called ribosomes to produce protein, a process called translation. Now, as you can remember, we have three types of RNA. The messenger RNA carries the coding instructions of an amino acid sequence of the protein to be made. The transport RNA carries specific amino acids to the ribosome to form the polypeptide chain. And the third one is the ribosome RNA which forms the ribosomes along with other ribosomal proteins. Now the bacterial ribosomes, as you can see on this slide, consist of two major components. The small ribosomal unit, which reads the RNA, and the large subunit, which joins amino acids to form a polypeptide chain. Now you see those yellow small numbers in our ribosomal unit here? The large subunit is also referred to as 50S and is made of 23S and 5S which numbers actually stand for the sedimentation coefficients of the rRNA in Svedberg units. And the small unit is referred to as 30S and is made of 16S. You also can notice here some letters. We have the P letter, which stands for the P site for peptidyl. The P site is the second binding site in the ribosome. The A site which stands for amino acid, is the first binding site in the ribosome. So during protein translation, the P site holds the tRNA. The tRNA is the pink weird looking shape <laughs> there that you can see on this slide, which is linked to the growing polypeptide chain. Now, why are these uh, tiny little details important to us? Well, because it is heavily tested on the steps and also to understand why the antibiotics that target bacterial protein synthesis do not destroy our human cells. The answer is that the ribosomes of eukaryotes are bigger than the ones in the prokaryotes, which are the bacteria. We humans have 60S rRNA, made of 28 and 23S, as a large ribosomal subunit and the 40S, which is the small ribosomal subunit, is made of 18S rRNA. So the antibiotics are so made that they will attack only the smaller prokaryotic ribosomal subunits. Now, how cool is that? Hmm? So let's go over the antibiotics that inhibit the large ribosomal subunit first. Here on the left, we have linezolid, 
which binds near the P site region on the bacterial 23S rRNA of the 50S subunit, as you can see here. So it prevents the formation of the 70S ribosomal unit. In other words, basically, linezolid disrupts the bacterial growth by inhibiting the initiation process of protein synthesis. Then we have chloramphenicol. Its mechanism of action is a little complicated, but for all intents and purposes, here's what's important to remember. Chloramphenicol prevents normal binding of the amino acid tRNA so that it becomes inaccessible to the peptidyl transferase which stands for PT that you can see on the screen. So this peptidyl transferase is needed to form a new peptide bond between the peptide at the P site and the peptide at the A site. Then moving on to the streptogramins here, we have type A streptogramin called dalfopristine and type B streptogramin called quinopristine. They bind near the A site region in the 50S ribosomal unit thus preventing translocation. The macrolides like azithromycin and the lincosamide antibiotic clindamycin bind to the elongation factor 2, what you see on the screen EF2, and thus they inhibit the translocation and the elongation of the peptide chain. Now we are moving on to the antibiotics that inhibit the small ribosomal unit. Now here something should uh, strike you as uh, weird or wrong or odd. Can you see what it is? Is there a group of antibiotics that we said it was bactericidal, but it's on the slide of bacteriostatic mechanism of action? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's the aminoglycosides. We said that they were bactericidal, and that is true indeed. But how do they work to directly kill the cell? The cool thing about aminoglycosides is they inhibit protein synthesis in the bacteria by binding irreversibly to the initiation complex of the 30S ribosomal unit. So the aminoglycosides, by binding to the 60S rRNA within the 30S ribosomal subunit, cause misreading of the genetic code and inhibit the translocation step of the protein synthesis process, which is, by the way, when two tRNA molecules together with the mRNA have moved through the ribosome which leads to misreading of the genetic code and incorporation of the wrong amino acids into the protein. Here's the fun part, right? These wrongly made proteins with the wrong incorporation of the wrong amino acids are sent to the bacterial cell wall and they're incorporated there, but because it's the wrong amino acid, they ruin the integrity of the cell wall, thus making this group Bactericidal. Moving on to the bacterial nucleic acid synthesis blocking antibiotics. Basically, these are the bactericidal antibiotics that damage the DNA. As you might know, the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells is that the eukaryotic cells have a nucleus where we store our DNA, whereas the prokaryotic cells, such as the bacteria, do not have nucleus, but they have just like free floating chromosome where they store their DNA. The fluoroquinolones, which were the ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, norfloxacin, ofloxacin, they exhibit their bactericidal action by inhibiting the bacterial replication by blocking the enzymes responsible for that, which are the DNA gyrase and the DNA topoisomerase 4. The sulfonamides and the TMP inhibit the synthesis of the tetrahydrofolate, THF, which is essential in the thymidine synthesis pathway, which at the end of the day leads to inhibition of the bacterial DNA synthesis. The sulfonamides, which include sulfamentoxazole, sulfadiazine, etc., do that by inhibiting the dihydropteroate synthetase enzyme, whereas the TMP binds to bacterial dihydrofolate reductase. Rifampin here inhibits the bacterial DNA dependent RNA synthesis by inhibiting the bacterial DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which ultimately leads to direct blocking of the elongating RNA. Metronidazole um, is also bactericidal, kills the bacteria by creating free radicals that damage the DNA. And uh, it's very important to know that for the metronidazole to function like that, 
it needs to be partially reduced, which happens only in anaerobic bacteria and protozoans. Moving on to the bacterial cell wall blocking antibiotics. In order to understand how this group of antibiotics work, we need to understand the structure of the bacterial cell wall. The cell wall of both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is composed of peptidoglycan. And this peptidoglycan is made of polysaccharide chains cross-linked by peptides containing D amino acids. And what makes the gram-negative bacteria gram-negative actually is the fact that they have only one single layer of peptidoglycan which is surrounded by a membranous structure called the outer membrane, which is made of lipopolysaccharides. On the other hand, the gram-positive bacteria do not have outer membrane, but instead they have a thick prostaglandin layer, which retains the color of the crystal violet stain in the gram stain. So on gram stain, the gram-positive bacteria will look violetish and the gram-negative bacteria will, will look more pinkish as the violet dye will be washed off, right? As they cannot retain it, again, due to the single layer of prostaglandin in their cell wall. Now let's see how this prostaglandin layer is made. And it's really cool. Um, the biosynthesis of the prostaglandin is mediated by enzymes called transpeptidases, very important enzymes, which facilitate the final transpeptidation or also called cross-linking of the prostaglandin layer. So this super important cross-linking is a step that is what gives the cell wall its rigidity. Now the transpeptidases, as we mentioned, are also called penicillin binding proteins. And I'm sure you know them, the, the famous PBPs. Do you know why they're called PBPs, penicillin binding proteins? Well, because the penicillins bind exactly there. The beta-lactams antibiotics, as you can see here, the carbapenems, all five generations of the cephalosporins, the monobactans and the penicillins are called beta-lactams because they all have beta-lactam ring in their structure, which ring binds to the, guess what? To the penicillin binding proteins, of course. So our beta-lactams inhibit the prostaglandin cross-linking and thus they stop the cell wall synthesis. So if a bacteria doesn't have a cell wall, bacteria undergo lysis and bacteria dies. On the other hand, vancomycin and bacitracin here inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis and lead again to the same final result, which is bacterial death. Unfortunately though, as we all know, bacteria are evolving and after years of exposing them to maybe too much beta-lactam antibiotics, they have developed a way to synthesize beta-lactamase enzyme which destroys the beta-lactam ring of our beautiful antibiotics and make them pretty much useless. As a result though, uh, we have fought back, so we came up with the beta-lactamase inhibitors, which block the bacterial beta-lactamase enzymes and allow our beautiful, again, beta-lactam antibiotics to do their job in peace. Such beta-lactamase inhibitors, if you want to know, are the clavulanic acid, sulbactam and tazobactam. Moving on to the antifungal mechanism of action, this is also easy peasy. Fungal cell walls are rigid and contain complex polysaccharides called hitin, which adds structural strength and also they're made of glucans. Ergosterol, which we all know, is the principal steroid molecule in the cell membranes and is basically the equivalent of cholesterol in the animal cell membranes and also what we have in our membranes, cholesterol, right? In our cell membranes. Also, very important thing to know is that the fungi here are eukaryotes and do have a complex cellular organization. But as eukaryotes, they have a membrane-bound nucleus where the DNA is wrapped around histone proteins. So here on this slide, as you can see, in blue is the fungal cell wall and in pink violetish is the fungal nucleus. We have the ergosterol here, the pores in the ergosterol and the glucan also on this slide. Let's first review the antifungals that attack the fungal cell wall. We have antifungals that uh, inhibit the ergosterol synthesis. These drugs are the azole drugs ketoconazole, itraconazole, voriconazole, etc. They actually block the 14-alpha-demethylase enzyme. And we also have the terbinafine, 
which blocks the squalene epoxidase enzyme. And both of these drug classes, they inhibit the ergosterol synthesis. This is super important, super high yield for all steps. Then we are moving on to the antifungals that create pores via aggregation of ergosterol, thus damaging the membrane function. Here in this category, we have the nistatin and amphotericin B. Then we have antifungals that inhibit the glucan synthesis. These are the fungin drugs like caspofungin. These fungin drugs actually they block the D-glucan synthetase. Now we're moving on to the fungal nucleus. We have the griseofulvin here, which inhibits the microspindle formation and stops the nuclear division. This is its mechanism of action. And we have the 5-flucytosine on the right side of this slide. The 5-flucytosine inhibit the protein synthesis. And to finish this super super high yield video, let's remind ourselves about the gram-negative and gram-positive microorganisms. So the gram-negative microorganisms are divided into diplococci, coxoid rods and rods. The first category we have the Neisseria meningitidis, which is maltose fermenting the Neisseria gonorrhea, which is maltose non-fermenting, and Moraxella and Velonella. In the second category, we have Haemophilus influenzae, Bordetella pertussis, Brucella and Pasturella. In the third category of gram-negative microorganism, the gram-negative rods, we have the lactose-fermenting E. coli, Enterobacter, Klebsiella and Serratia, and the lactose non-fermenting H. pylori, Salmonella, Shigella, Proteus, and Pseudomonas. The gram-positive microorganisms are again divided into three categories. We have the Staphylococci, which are catalase positive. We have Staph aureus here, which is coagulase positive. The Staph epidermidis, which is coagulase negative. And the Staph saprophyticus, which is also coagulase negative. In the second category, we have the streptococci, which are catalase negative. We have the ones who cause alpha or partial hemolysis. We have here strep pneumonia and strep virions. Then the ones who cause beta or complete hemolysis are the strep pyogenes and strep agalactiae. And the enterococci and the strep galoliticus cause gamma or no hemolysis. The gram-positive rods include the Clostridium, the Corinebacterium, Listeria, Bacillus anthracis, Bacillus cereus, Nocardia, and Actinomyces. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video useful. I'll see you next week.